get behind the scenes of what happens in the uh, summit. Um, so we have about 20 minutes uh, for um, questions. Q and A. If I could, if you could uh, identify your identity. And you talked a lot about U.S. interest in um, Southeast Asian nations, and I wanted to particularly talk about Burma, Myanmar. Um, what are the U.S. incentives in in trying to engage with Burma in, in engaging in reform? I know that Burma is a country with lots of natural resources, gas, timber, gems. But aside from that, I also think it could possibly be because of its strategic location. You know, like you said, um, in between, it's a country in between two superpowers, China and India. So do you think that, it, can you talk a little bit about why the U.S. might be so interested in reforms of Burma? <coughs> A colleague of her uh, from the Cambodian service at VOA. So, but some from the uh, VOA Cambodian service. Uh, I had a question. Um, since Cambodia is the chair of ASEAN this year, um, what do you, besides the headaches, I think, um, what what agendas does uh, what does Indonesia think um, that Indonesia started last year? Uh, initiative that Indonesia started last year um, that Indonesia would like to see the future chairs especially Cambodia this year, as well as future chair of ASEAN, continue. And if I could have like a half a question related to that, um, Indonesia pushed a lot on the human rights front, uh, including the ASEAN Intergovernment uh, uh, Human Rights Commission. Um, now, given the rotating nature of ASEAN chair, um, is Indonesia concerned that the level of upholding and the mission of uh, uh, that particular committee, uh, commission is, is going to be realized? Um, my name is George Borman, uh, and a student here, a master's student at, uh, at American University, and also uh, uh, working at the CSIS, as we met before. And uh, I was just wondering uh, quickly, what steps could be made to improve the um, uh, conditions for FBI investment, seeing that Indonesia is becoming more of a focus, uh, uh, more of a center for FBI investment in uh, ASEAN, uh, what steps could be made by the United States and by Indonesia to make this process easier to uh, to increase the flows of the deal. Good. Well, look, I'm not an expert on America's policy uh, on Myanmar, but I think uh, 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 the U.S. Uh, policy shift on Myanmar is a uh, useful one, and, and in fact. Uh, uh, Look, when it comes to Myanmar, there's always this question, what is the right thing to do? Is it uh, engagement or sanction? <laughs> you know? And for ASEAN, it's always been engagement. Uh, and we realize that it has its limitations, and other countries may have a different uh, view. Uh, but for some reason, uh, history and severe in Myanmar, even after elections that some say was uh, some of them were, were criticized by some. Uh, we were blessed uh, by the fact that the new government that was resulted from that elections actually were quite serious in promoting reforms. And it's very important that uh, the reformers, look, in any democratic transition, you always have reformers and those who still favor the status quo, right? And you always will have a test one between the two. And I think it's very important whatever ASEAN does and whatever America does and others does, uh, helps to uh, first advance Myanmar's democratic transition, and secondly, helps to solidify the the win for the reformers to move on. Right? Uh, it's important for us when we had our democratic transitions. Uh, we had big tussle between those who favored reform and those who favored the old status quo. But uh, in the last 12 years, those who favored reform really took off. Uh, and the international environment made it very easy for them to, to, to take off. To the point that now, in Indonesia, democracy is uh, irreversible, it has achieved a point of no return, right? And I think this is where we, we should encourage Myanmar to go. Uh, you know, it's only been a year or so since the elections and the uh, transition is still fragile. Uh, and I think we need to ensure that the reformers really take stronger hold in Myanmar. Uh, Do you think that the U.S. is trying to possibly counteract with China? I think this question is something that you should address to U.S. officials. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Good.
Um, now, you ask what are the uh, future agendas? Look, it's up from Myanmar. As I said earlier, every chairman must decide what are the priorities. Uh, so I think uh, it's up for Cambodia to determine uh, what they want to do in terms of establishing priorities. Uh, uh, I think this is the time where they're about to do that. Uh, I don't know if they have actually uh, made announcement on, on uh, their priorities. Indonesia did not really uh, do so until I think in, in the second quarter of, of, of the year in terms of our chairmanship. Uh, but <coughs> we would hope, of course, that the declaration of uh, ASEAN Concord 3, which specifies what ASEAN wants to do after 2005, uh, 2015 is given more flesh, uh, more flesh. Uh, this means more concrete action plan and so on and so on. And I think that's quite important to maintain the momentum of the Bali Concord 3. And the other one would be uh, to make sure that the discussions in the ASEAN-China working group uh, on the uh, on the South China Sea uh, moves fast. Uh, I know none of us want to see another 10 years to happen before this code of conduct is being finalized. Right? We don't have 10 years. And uh, I know that uh, our Cambodian friends are working hard to make sure that uh, that discussion maintains uh, its, uh, its uh, momentum. Uh, but I think what is also important uh, without this being a policy specific area. You know, uh, Kevin Rudd says that uh, Asia Pacific is unique in that economically, uh, there's a great deal of architecture in the Asia Pacific. But security wise, there's a big gap. Uh, Asia Pacific security architecture resembles what happened in Europe in the 19th century, right? So there's a gap in the economic architecture, which is quite advanced. You know, you have APEC, and you have all the other things, and the security architecture, which is still marked by mistrust and uh, division and, and potential conflicts and so on and so on. Uh, and I think uh, it is Cambodia's challenge how you minimize that gap, you know, how you minimize that gap, and especially for ASEAN to probably help uh, uh, ensure that America and China uh, have good, solid, cooperative relationships, or in the term of uh, American Secretary of State, positive cooperative relationship. Uh, ASEAN can help. Uh, we don't need to leave it only to China and America. We have a way to help uh, ensure that. Now, uh, you ask, uh, my minute. Oh, FDI, Indonesia is very happy. I don't know if you, there was a, a very embarrassing video on YouTube. Uh, you can, you can uh, search it. It's, Dino Jala, which is my name, and Moonwalk. Uh, because uh, I made the bet with my staff that if Indonesia ever made it in, as a uh, investment grade, uh, uh, which is for the first time in a long time, that I would do a moonwalk in front of business uh, <laughs> business executive, which is what I did, and they they shot it, they filmed it, and put it on YouTube, which is fine by me. <laughs> so, but uh, there's a lot of opportunities in, in Indonesia. We don't consider ourselves a third world country anymore. Uh, we, I never really like that term, third world country, because it presumes that in the train there's a first class passenger, second class passenger, and a third class passenger, and we're a third class passenger. Now we call ourselves emerging economies. Uh, Indonesia has the largest middle class in Southeast Asia. We have the largest economy in Southeast Asia, uh, and uh, uh, we're the third highest growth uh, in, in Asia, and we are a member of G20 now. So, the Indonesia's economic landscape is changing, and 50% of our population is below the age of uh, 29. So, we have a very young population and connected. Uh, we have the second Facebook users in the world, and third largest for Twitter users. So, do we have very innovative and connected young people, and they're driving our political and economic reforms. So, uh, it's, not an, it's not a difficult sell. Uh, and I tell all people who want to invest in Indonesia, look at all the companies that put money in Indonesia. The moment they put money in, their money grows quite phenomenally. Uh, you can ask any companies that have done that, and that is a better sales pitch than I could ever uh, offer them. Next three questions. Okay, um, uh, yes, can I have you? And then the uh, Vita, and perhaps uh, what, maybe go, oh, yes. Identify 
Hello, good afternoon. My name is Santi. I graduated from American Univers uh, University last December uh, from the Government Management Program. Uh, my question is that uh, you mentioned a lot about the economic growth in the region um, that exceeds world growth uh, and how it has been very impressive, and also um, the economic growth in Indonesia. But also at the same time, the social gap has also been widening um, between the urban or the rural areas uh, and a lot of other social issues. So what are the concrete and actionable steps that either ASEAN or even Indonesian government um, is taking or even planning to take in the future uh, to tackle these social issues such as inequality? Thank you. Oh. Hi, I'm, Andy. I'm a student here at American University. Um, going off of what Santi said, there's obviously a lot of economic growth and political reforms in Indonesia, and that's been a very good <coughs> sign, but we're still very much a developing and growing country. What do you think is the most significant barrier to development in Indonesia faces today, and what can be done by the Indonesian government to address those issues? Questions? Yes, I'm Jojo from the Voice of America. From your service, uh, Burma is taking the Asian chair in uh, the 2014. But you still have human rights violation and conflicts in some areas uh, in the country. So, uh, what would be uh, you know, the major challenges for the Burmese government in taking the Asian chair in 2014? So, and you're from what? From, from America. So you're asking what should the Burmese government do to address human rights? Yeah, what would be the major challenges for the Burmese government taking the ASEAN chair in the Sorry, good. Well, you know, that there's a very good report. Uh, you should look at the Asia Development uh, Bank a report. It's titled The Asian Century. Uh, it's very, very important and very interesting report. <coughs> and it produced two scenarios. And the reason why I say this is the scenario also is true for Indonesia. The one scenario is the optimistic scenario of what Asia will be in 2050. And it says that uh, in the optimistic or good scenario, the GDP total would be $160 billion. Uh, there would be an additional two billion, additional two billion people joining the middle class, right? Uh, there will be no poor country at all. And uh, all other countries in uh, Asia would have living standards similar to uh, Europe today, right? So that's the good scenario. And the uh, bad scenario is uh, they started to rise in terms of their income and economic growth, but they become stagnant, uh, what is known as the middle income trap. So instead of reaching 160 billion, uh, you are stuck, in Asia is stuck with about uh, 80 billion dollars, right? Uh, sorry, 80, sorry, 80 trillion uh, dollars uh, combined uh, GDP. And you don't have, uh, you still have pockets of poverty uh, within uh, Asia, uh, and a lot less of than uh, two billion people joining the middle class. Uh, and things would get stagnant for a while for many countries in Asia. So I think Indonesia's uh, challenge is how to avoid that negative scenario and work hard to achieve the uh, positive scenario. And I think, uh, you know, uh, the most important thing for us to achieve uh, is a change of mindset. You know, if you ask me what is the most important thing that happened to China uh, in 1976 and afterwards, and in India, 1990 afterwards, people would say it's the explosion of this trade and investment policy openness, uh, great statistics, you know, China's economy doubled between 1978 and 1988, doubled again, 88 to 98, and according to Jim uh, O'Neill, China's economy between 2001 until now quadrupled, which means China produced three Chinas in the last, uh, you know, decade or so, right? Now, uh, but if you ask me what happened, it's not the numbers that were exploding, it's the mindset. You know, uh, China became like that because their mindset changed. India became like that because the mindset changed. And for Indonesia to fulfill our optimistic projection of becoming the top 10 world economies in the coming decades, you can't reach it with the present mindset. I'll tell you now, you know, uh, being a member of the young generation, you gotta have uh, a mindset that seeks to embrace change even more rather than resisting it. 
uh, you have to love globalization rather than be afraid of it. Uh, there was a recent report by Le Fondation Politique, I don't know how to say it in French, you know, but it's one of the most interesting reports that I've read that found uh, interesting statistics. They asked people around the world, the youth, what they think about globalization, what they think about nationalism and so on. And they found, in terms of globalization, interestingly, they found that the highest number of youth who love globalization, not just like it, but love it and see it as an opportunity for the country to be seized and so on, is China. 91% of China's youth love globalization. In India, it's about 89%, right? Uh, with America, it's below. I think it's about 76% of the American, sorry, of American youth who think that they love globalization. And for other countries, it's even below. For Greece, I think it's about 41% and so on, right? But <laughs> ensuring that the present generation and the future generations get this, that they see that the 21st century must be an era where you are not dogmatic, not ideological, and become pragmatic and see the world not as a threat and opportunity. If you have that implanted in the mind of our leaders and our generation, I think Indonesia will exceed uh, beyond uh, expectation. And you know as well as I do that in Indonesia now, what worries me is that you have Young, young generation going into politics and becoming business people, but some of them are more conservative than the previous generation. All right? You see this. You see this trend. Uh, some of them are even longing for the authoritarian days and so on and so on. And what we need to tell them is, you go on the other way. You know, every generation must be more progressive, more open, more moderate and more globalized and more internationalized than the previous generation. And that is the rule by which nations succeed as they pursue their, their transformations. And I think this answers both the other questions. You asked about, oh, Myanmar. Look, I think the challenge is really to make sure that the present uh, uh, democratic, democratization process uh, continues. Now, what the world needs to know is this. There is no democratic transition that goes with a straight line forward in an upward trajectory, nothing. Indonesia did not experience that, uh, and South Korea did not experience that, and you know, many other countries around the world. There's bound to be ups and downs, stop and go process in Myanmar's democratic transition. Now with Indonesia, what mattered most was whatever happened, whatever, stop and go process we experienced, we never lost faith in democracy. We never did. Even when we had separatism, when our economy went down to minus 13%, uh, when people were losing faith in government and so on, when we had constitutional crisis, we kept saying democracy is the best, right? We kept faith in democracy. Now, Myanmar is going to have the same, uh, experience the same. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen when Hassan Suu Kyi and NLD will take part in the election for the results and what happens after that. We know that Myanmar has completed the seven road to democracy, uh, seven steps, and now it's going to the next phase. Uh, but it's going to continue to have problems and it has remained, uh, it continues to face the, the ethnic challenges, uh, which we Indonesia also face, not just democratic challenges, but uh, ethnic challenges, uh, ethnic rebellions that we need to resolve uh, at the same time. And I think the, not only the Myanmarese, but the world need to understand that. Don't every time Myanmar has a problem and experience a stop-go process, don't hit Myanmar with the head. You know, you gotta, you know, I believe in this. I believe from our democratic transition, for democracies to grow, you gotta let them make mistakes. And this is, the lesson that Arab Spring countries will also experience. Because the process of making mistakes make you a better democracy, right? Uh, you know, just like a child, a child who's never been spanked, who's never uh, made mistakes, uh, doesn't turn out to be as mature and strong as he should be as a man. And I think uh, uh, when Myanmar experienced this tribulation and make mistakes and learn from his mistakes, uh, they will become a strong democracy. And the world needs to understand that. So on that note, um, we have come to the close of this um, wonderful presentation by Ambassador Dino Patikala. And I'd like to, um, a very, very humble, but heartfelt gift. Thank you.
give uh, uh, Kaitun uh, uh, a gift that I found, and it's very American gift that I brought uh, uh, to American University. I don't know about this gift, but I learned it in America, and it's very American, which is called a big hug. <laughs>